This is Professor Mike Ventola from Sand Hills Community College bringing you Grass of the Week. Welcome to our first Grass of the Week lecture. I'm Professor Mike Ventola and today we'll be talking about Kentucky bluegrass. That's Poa pretensis. L is for Linus. He's the guy that named the grass. You will not be required to know that. To start out, we're going to talk about cool season grasses. Cool season grasses have a C3 biochemistry metabolism. That means they're much better suited for cooler weather. And at the end of the course, when it gets warmer and they start growing, we're going to talk about the C4 metabolism and the difference between the two. But for right now, we're going to talk about the cool season grasses that grow predominantly in the northern region of the United States. That's Michigan, where I'm from up here in East Lansing, where Michigan State is, and anywhere above the transition zone. We currently are located here in Pinehurst, North Carolina. That's right at the bottom of the transition zone. As you see, when we blow up North Carolina, there are three distinct regions. The cool season grasses are very well suited for the western North Carolina mountains. In the Piedmont, they do well parts of the year, and on the coastal plain, they don't do well very much at all. As you see, we also have a southern zone. This is the area that's much more suited for C4 grasses. We'll see that on, on putting greens in the south, usually they're Bermuda grass. However, there are places right here where we have a graduate in Florida, a golf course called Red Stick that has bent grass. If you choose to do that, to grow cool season grasses in the transition zone, you're going to have problems. They're going to be, have to be babied and be sick, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. But today, we're talking pretty much about Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass is not a grass that is used a lot in North Carolina. It's probably a grass that should be used a little more in, in North Carolina, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. But all the cool season grasses have the advantage of being green in the winter. And the, the snowbirds and the Yankees that come down here enjoy seeing green grass in the winter when they're here. So let's get right into Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass, one of my old mentors, Dr. Reed Funk, who hopefully you'll be able to hear on uh, one of our podcasts calls Kentucky bluegrass the Cadillac of lawn grasses. And it makes sense. When you have a Cadillac, it's expensive. It takes money, it takes gas, it takes polishing. But if you take care of it, it will take care of you. This is not a low maintenance grass. This is a high maintenance grass. And it has requirements such. As you see, um, home of the Detroit Tigers, Tiger Stadium. One of my former students is the grounds uh, crew leader right there. And um, they've got Kentucky bluegrass, and it looks pretty good. And so this is really a high-maintenance, high-input grass. This is Dr. Melody Frazier. She is a researcher for pure seed testing up in North Raleigh. Many of you will be able to go in one of the labs up to visit her plots. But you can see these are Kentucky bluegrass plots. And if I line out the plots, you can see there's dramatic differences in that grass and that is because Kentucky bluegrass is apomictic and apomictic means that it does not reproduce sexually very often so when you buy a clone or when you buy a Kentucky bluegrass it's fairly unique most other grasses are not like that when you buy other grasses usually there's a hundred or two hundred clones in the bag but Kentucky bluegrass is very very unique very genetically similar in the makeup of all the grasses that are in each box. This makes it, when it does reproduce sexually, in change, you can have very dark cultivars. You can have cultivars like Midnight. So there's lots of different cultivars, and Dr. Frazier is doing some of the first work on that gra this grass in North Carolina. One of the main features of the, all the bluegrasses is the boat-shaped leaf tip. That's a V, a boat, almost like a Viking ship. 
when you hold the grass, you, you would rip off a piece of this turf here, the blade, and hold it in your hand, and it will point up. That's very important to note. This also here is a rhizome, which we've talked about in class, and you'll be able to see that this is also one of the distinct features of Kentucky bluegrass. Only Kentucky bluegrass will have the rhizomes. All bluegrasses will have the boat-shaped leaf tip. They have a folded vernation. And we talked about vernation. Remember, if you hold this portion of the plant right here, the sheath in your finger or here, and roll it, it will not roll like a pencil. It will flip. It will flop, flop over. So that's a very important thing to notice when you're going to identify this grass. That's the first thing when we go onto the dichotomous key. The other thing is there are translucent veins along the midrib of the leaf. This is very important because you can see when you hold it up to the light, all the blue grasses will have these translucent veins. We almost call them racing stripes. So it will be helpful if you in lab can take this grass grab a leaf, hold it up, and see that it's boat shaped. If you know that it's a cool season grass, then you'll know that it's a bluegrass. And we're going to identify whether it's a Kentucky bluegrass, annual bluegrass, which we'll talk about in two weeks, or Poet Trivialis, which is rough stock bluegrass, which we will talk about next week. So one of the big advantages of Kentucky bluegrass is the fact that it's got these rhizomes. So that's energy to do that, but the plant spreads wide. It doesn't spread short, and this makes it probably the best sod-producing cool-season turf grass. Most all sod farms in the north grow this grass. It's apomictic. A-P-O-M-I-C-T-I-C. -I -I that means that all of the seeds on this plant are the same. So when they come out and are planted, they will be exactly the same. That has its advantage, a big advantage in uniformity and looks. It has a disadvantage in the fact that if a disease mutates to kill one clone, it will kill all the, ter all the grass. And that's one of the stories of uh, Marion, Kentucky bluegrass, was a, a bluegrass that was resistant to striped smut in one little spot. There was one little piece of grass at Marion, Country Club in Pennsylvania, well, they found that and they, they spread that all over because it thought it was totally resistant to striped smut. Well, it turns out it was not. It turns out that the disease mutated and then striped smut got on all the Marion. So we have some cultivars. There's a cultivar called Barron, which is a very prolific seed producer, which makes it efficient for the breeders to produce. This makes it widely distributed which makes it widely distributed for the disease to also work on so this grass gets striped smut some of the newer cultivars midnight and things that melody has produced recently do not get striped smut yet but if they were to go worldwide and be everywhere they probably would so it's a battle between the breeders and the disease and um and it's a catch-up and uh, things like that so this grass um because it puts so much energy into rhizomes in top growth, it's very slow to establish. So probably two seasons to do that. We can see it has a short membranous ligule, and it also forms a nice tight-knit sod. So when we can come through with the sod cutter and cut it there, we've got all these nice rhizomes to hold it together. Some of the grasses we're going to talk about later, particularly tall fescue, you would have to put a netting or something to hold it together. But this grass has a natural netting. When we look on our dichotomous key, when we look through, we're going to see that it's folded in the bud sheath, and we're going to eventually get over to Kentucky Bluegrass. So open your book to page 13 and follow through um, Kentucky Bluegrass while I go through the next slide and explain all of these parts. But there is uh, some of the bluegrasses. There's Kentucky Bluegrass. So you'll follow all the way across on that line. So Pope Pretensis, Kentucky Bluegrass. It's folded in the vernation, so when you roll it in your fingers, it will flop. It will not roll. The ligule is short, 0.2 millimeters in membranous. It has no oracle. 
the growth habit ha is aggressive rhizomes. So when I've, I've highlighted rhizomes there, that's the main identifying feature. Once you know that it's a cool season grass and you know that it has boat-shaped leaf tips, you're going to look for the growth habit. And the growth habit of this grass is rhizominous. So that's going to be, if you see rhizomes, don't be afraid to dig down in the soil and look for that rhizome. If you see it's a bluegrass and it has rhizomes, we're pretty sure that it's Kentucky bluegrass. The sheath is split, but not very prominent, and I would really concentrate on the rhizomes and not the sheath. The collar is slightly divided, and the blade is boat-shaped with racing stripes. So again, those are the two things, the boat-shaped with racing stripes and the rhizomes. And you can see up in the northeast, when we're doing bunker work or an area that needs to be sodded, all on this hill is Kentucky bluegrass. So this sod's just getting going. But it's a great grass for rough areas on golf courses, for home lawns, for any area that you really want to showpiece where you want to show off your Cadillac. Um, one recent use of Kentucky bluegrass. Um, one recent use of Kentucky bluegrass. This is uh, Scott Walker, one of my former students. He did his internship at Oakmont, and this is the Kentucky bluegrass when they were getting it ready for the U.S. Open in 2007. So you can see a very formidable opponent. You probably would not want to hit a golf shot out of that, as was evident from the injury that Phil Mickelson incurred when they had this grass cut this high. And they actually cut it down for the open because that, that was too high and too difficult. But he was there a week early and actually got injured and uh, was taken out of the tournament because of this grass. The Grass of the Week music is the Sand Hills Community College Jazz Band directed by Tim Haley. <laughs> 